September, after my husband Mike died back in 2018, my brother and sister-in-law invited me to go with them to Scotland. Partly we were going out of curiosity because it's one of the places that some of our ancestors came from before they came to this continent, and that was way back before the Revolutionary War. And partly we went to experience that geography and that culture. So while we were there, we were on a tour, and we traveled around various parts of Scotland, rural and urban. And we were in two smallish bands. It wasn't a big group, about 19 of us, I think. And we would stop and get out and walk through the fields around the town or through buildings that were significant to Scottish history. And yes, many parts of the countryside do look like East Tennessee. It's no wonder so many Scots settled here in the Southern Appalachians. It looked like home. And one day we spent quite a bit of time in an area where sheep raising was common. We walked around a big farm looking at the geographic features and hearing from the people who lived there about the area's history and noting the, the sheep feeding and that were wandering around us and feeding here and there. And at the end of that activity, we had some time to talk. We were gathered back together with the farming company who ran the place. We had some time to talk with them. And I had a question for them. And that question was, what are those red stripes we saw on the sheep's backs? Each sheep had a short red stripe marked on its wool. Maybe on the head, maybe on the side, maybe on the back. But those marks didn't seem to go down to the skin. They weren't like, um, how we uh, mark cattle in our country. Those marks didn't go down to the skin, but they were simply a red colored swatch uh, placed randomly, it seemed like, on top of the layers of wool, one swipe per sheep. It was almost as if a child had gotten his or her hands on a bucket of red dye and a paintbrush and had just gone around and tried it out on whatever sheep he or she ran into. The farmer explained to me that those red stripes are the equivalent of branding. Each farm uses a different color for marking, and so if somehow a sheep gets mixed in with the wrong herd or is discovered wandering lost by somebody, they can tell who it belongs to. Everybody will know. Everybody can then return it to its owner. I didn't ask, but I, I'm guessing that those marks are permanent on that upper layer of wool and they are reapplied every year after that sheep is shorn. The old wool is gone. So you paste it, you paint it on the top layer of what's left, and as the wool grows out, the, that mark is still there. There's no trauma to the sheep when they're marked, and it's quicker and much easier, I think, that sounds like that anyway, than applying a heated branding iron. It only affects that top layer of wool and it lasts from one shear to the next. So what a great solution. Let's mark shepherds. And we are marked by our good shepherd too. When we're baptized in the Episcopal Church, we not only receive our cleansing with water and join Christ in the watery burial of an old life and a new birth or resurrection into a new life, we are also marked with chrism in the sign of the cross. Olive oil that's been blessed, a particular prayer for chrism. That is our branding. That's what we wear, if not on the outside of our foreheads. Uh, we do it, it, it's permeating our, hopefully, our minds and our hearts. We're repeatedly marked with that cross in the church, as we, and maybe at home, as we repent our sins and receive God's forgiveness. We make the sign of the cross, or we make this sign of the cross. We bless God as we did in the opening service. We say, blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that marks us as the kind of, of God's people that we are. <clears throat> and when we receive Christ's body and blood, recognizing that his identity is being made, fed into us as our identity, noticing that we are taking on his purposes and his faithfulness as our own, we swallow the bread and the wine as his body and blood and are marked with him. We receive this living, resurrected, transformed reality into our physical bodies at communion, 
so that, as Augustine said, we can behold who we are and become what we receive. Behold who we are and become what we receive. Mark with the cross. This fourth Sunday in Easter is sometimes called Good Shepherd Sunday. At least that's what I call it. Because that metaphor for Christ's eternal saving and healing presence among us runs through our collect and our psalm and our gospel lesson and our epistle. Good Shepherd Sunday. That sounds like an early morning, easy stroll with Jesus through a, maybe a flower-sprinkled meadow with sunlights and flowers, kind of like that sheep farm that I was on that day. And you've seen artists and renderings of Jesus the Good Shepherd, kind of like that, I'm sure. Often, Jesus looks like an Anglo from the 1970s. He has loose, slightly curled hair, light brown, if you will, with a gold highlighter too here and there, and flowing robes and a couple of nice colors, gentle colors, and maybe a dreamy, gentle look on his face. And in his hand, he carries a tall, perfectly carved wooden crook. And there's a trail of very white sheep following along behind him. <laughs> that kind of scene puts us anxious sheep at ease. It's a beautiful picture, and if we are following Jesus as our shepherd, well, look what a great life it is. Sometimes we do expect his rod and staff is going to comfort us immediately if we get face to face with any predators or walk into any dangerous territory as we follow him. We do expect goodness and mercy to follow us all the days of our life, every single one of them. But remember, our good shepherd, the one we say we want to follow, is Jesus. Jesus, not some TV hero. His life did not look like a TV commercial from Riggio, Blossom and Bloom, Ginseng, and Botetin Volumizing Shampoo. <laughs> He's not even a model for Birkenstock sandals. <laughs> He's a real sweaty person, a Lord who walked and talked, who sweated and his feet got dirty, and he liked a good glass of wine at family weddings, and who called out from the cross in his agony, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he offered us bread and wine and foot washing water as friends gathered around him. And we know where he ended up after walking through the dark passage of Gethsemane. We know where Jesus ended up at the end of his earthly path. And so if we follow him all the days of our lives, is that where we're going to end up? Being tried falsely, insulted, condemned by a crowd, desperately in pain? Probably not. But who knows? Maybe. We don't know what we will have to walk through as we follow this good shepherd. If we're just looking for a Lord who makes sure that we are always walking through meadows in the sunshine, that we don't have to, so we don't have to walk blindly through unforeseen difficulties, that we never suffer fear for our loved ones or pain for ourselves, we might have chosen the wrong shepherd. If we want an easy, joy-filled life, simple, Pleasant. We may have the wrong Lord accompanying us on our trek through this world that is of great joy and great woe. If we're expecting sunshine and lollipops and rainbows all the time, we might need to read a few more gospel stories to figure out the plot of our lives as we look at the plot of Jesus' lives and those of his followers. So let's talk about that path on which we follow the Good Shepherd. It leads through death. That is, into death, on the path of death, and out of death, into resurrection. It is a kind of path of many kinds of death <coughs> that is followed, though, by new and transformed life. The life we have known good or bad, dies, and the life we can hardly imagine follows. It's not just at the end of our physical life. If I've experienced it, and I'm sure you have, through much of your life on the path following Jesus so far. 
Think about those times when the life you had anticipated eagerly just collapses around you. A spouse leaves, a child is crippled, and your life is radically changed. You're not walking through the meadow anymore. You have learned new ways of being an adult, new ways of parenting, new ways of being your parent's child. We have to learn those things, and each of them is not easy. Maybe your parents, at some point, suffered an unanticipated downturn in income and could no longer buy you that used car you were looking forward to after you graduated from high school and had a driver's license. They could no longer send you to a particular school or pay your college education, excuse me, your college tuition. Maybe they have to sell the family house even and move into an apartment or in a house with other relatives. We don't know. Each of those changes was a death from one life to the beginning of another. So I'm asking you to think, what has changed in you? What has changed in the people you love and the ways that you have lived ever after those events that at least for a little bit feel like a death? Think about the time your friend's baby died even before birth. Think about that job you lost because the company redefined its mission or its customer base and you don't need it anymore. Think about the time your long, hard efforts for some academic achievement or musical recognition just flopped. Remember when a good friend died of breast cancer way too early or in a car wreck as a teenager or were sent to Vietnam or Afghanistan and never came back. Those were deaths that you went through. Think about the diagnosis of your mother or father's terminal illness and how that affected you. Remember even the stories of the hardships that your parents or grandparents faced in the Great Depression or the disastrous heart attack that laid your grandfather out of work for the rest of his life. Think about that fiance who realized before the two of you got to the altar that marriage really wasn't the right future for the two of you. What did that seem like to you then? Probably a death of a lot of wonderful possibilities. Tell yourself once more about how you once felt so deeply called to a particular role or some serious adventure or some deep intention to serve other people and you just could not make it happen. Those may have been some of the valleys of death of, that you have walked through following Christ. Or maybe your valley of the shadow of death has been facing a dead end to how you've coped all your life. Maybe you realize now that all your struggle to be just a little better, better than you were, better than this kid next to you in class, better than the uh, wife who lives down the street, just a little better, more productive, more capable, more compliant, more right, more faultless than your school buddies or your colleagues, and how that has led to nothing but exhausted self-focus. Maybe your effort to recreate yourself more perfectly than God created you finally breaks you open like a cracked eggshell. And here we are now, transformed on the other side of those deaths, those breakthroughs into the far side of your dreams or dedications or delusions, and voila, we have been given an opportunity for resurrection. We've been given an opportunity for transformation to become a different sort of person than we were, the one that seemed like it was about to kill us. Maybe we've been blessed with new possibilities for health and salvation one day after another. Think about the changes you've made in your life and how they may have freed you up and how they may have begun in pain. Through that death that you thought was killing you, you have come out and been risen to a new life in the Lord's life. Maybe a way of picturing it is that the deaths are doorways into new births, like the death of Jesus into his birth into heaven, his resurrection among us and then with the Father. Maybe they are like new moldings, new escape from the cells that had encased us, new room now for maturing and more peace. The 
from our striving who's to do it. More room for fleshing out a greater vision, one that's freer and fuller of rejoicing than the ones where we fight so hard. I don't know about you all, but my life has flourished most deeply, I mean spiritually, after some personal prunings, after some degree of dying to whom I thought I should be and how I thought I should be, dying to how I have tried to be not only okay, but better. <coughs> and I have found myself most revived, most free to love and serve the Lord, to love, serve, and enjoy my neighbors, and to steer myself into a freer, sunnier cove when at least part of the old me has died and been left behind. So I pray for all of us today that we will follow that good shepherd of the Lord, yes, through green pastures and beside still waters, even when, maybe especially when, we have trudged our dragging feet through the muck and mire of the valley of the shadow. May we not fight the freedom of being forgiven. May our sense of sadness and maybe even of despising ourselves based on the sins we have committed, we've all committed them. May we take on the freedom of forgiveness because God has offered it constantly to everyone all the time. May we not hurry to save ourselves simply because we're afraid. Maybe we can offer our fear to that good shepherd and let him carry it for a while. Let him relieve us of it or show us that the path's not going to kill us. May we truly follow the one who loves us through our painful endings and into newer, more life-giving beginnings. May we follow our good shepherd through every valley of the shadow so that we can be led into the light of day. As we have prayed our collect for the day, may we know Jesus as the one who calls us each by name, and may we follow where he leads. For with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, he lives and reigns in every kind of terrain, whether it's the beautiful meadow or the valley of the shadow of death or the beautiful sunlight that comes next. With the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Jesus lives and reigns in every kind of terrain, our one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Amen.